Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father, fellow redeemed children of God. The portion of God's word for meditation this afternoon is from Luke chapter 23, verses 32 to 34. Uh, two other men, both criminals, were also led out with him to be executed. When they came to the place called the Skull, there they crucified him along with the criminals, one on his right, the other on his left. <clears throat> Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they divided up his clothes by casting lots. So far, the word of our Lord. How many of you like music? Okay. I know you guys do because you guys sang wonderfully for me. He did all those things for me. Thank you for sharing that with us, that message. But there's another song that I don't know, I don't know if you've heard it yet. It's, it's before you were born. Maybe before some of your parents were even born. Uh, it, it goes like this. <clears throat> okay, the words are, I was born by a river in a little tent. And just like the river, I've been running ever since. Who knows who sang that song? There's a guy named Sam Cooke. And he goes on to say, a change is going to come. A change is going to come. How many of you have ever gone through change in your life? Put your hand up. Oh, there we go. Okay, this is class participation. Okay, change. How many of you don't like change? <laughs> you see the problem we have? How many of you know that there will be change in the future? Okay, so I, I know we're smart people, so I'll talk to you intelligently. If we know there's going to be change, if we know there has been change, if we've experienced change, then why don't we embrace change? We, we know, as Sam Cooke says, a change is going to come. There will be change in our lives. We experience it within the church. Let's, let's go back a little bit to the blue hymnal. Oh, remember that? <laughs> that was one of the things that, that made me want to become a pastor. There was this phrase in there where they would say, um, it is meet and right so to do. Oh, I, I love that phrase. It sounded so regal. It is meet and right so to do. I love that phrase. And now it's, yeah, it's good. And all right, yeah. so to do. But from the blue hymnal to the, to the red hymnal. And, and just so you know, you saw it on Wells Connection. There'll be another hymnal coming out soon. I'm assuming it'll be red too. When it comes out, we've kind of stuck with red the last two times. But there'll be more changes in there. The, the, I, I can't guarantee you that a mighty fortress will be on 200 anymore. Because it used to not be. And I don't know where you're going to find, I know that my Redeemer lives. That, that can be anywhere in the hymnal. A change is going to come. We know that. Some of you learned your passages with these and thou's in there. Remember that? And then they changed from the King James Version and now it's used in yours. And there's, there was a recent one that now takes out his and hers. But there's another one coming up that's going to put back in the, the them's and theirs. <laughs> so don't worry. But, but, but there's going to be some change. And you've gone from the standard black robe to the white robe to the, to the beige robe. You know, maybe not your church, but that's out there. Change comes to the church. And yet, we kick against it and we push back about change, bless you. We push back all the time, but we know what's going to come. But not just in our church life, in our personal life. Even you've gone through change. Yes, you. You went from crawling to walking. And just imagine how big a change that is. Your viewpoint for everything gets to be twice as big all of a sudden. Crawling to walking. You went from walking to being a teenager. Oh, the only the Lord helped us through that. From a teenager to a person with a full-time job with, with real bills to be paid. You went from working 40 plus hours a week to being retired. And, and now we're having what some might say is expendable time. But if you ever talk to a retired person, they're so busy doing stuff. Change. And maybe it's your body that changes you get, as you get older. But change is going to come. And for some reason, we kick against it all the time. And we don't like it. Our Savior experienced change. 
we know the biggest change he experienced, right? He went, came from heaven to earth. As we had that song, to show the way. That, that song di di dictates, or uh, I should say, it demonstrates how we came from heaven with all perfection down to earth with all of our imperfection and our sinfulness. He did that huge change. But even while he was here, he experienced change. He went from a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes in Bethlehem to a toddler in Egypt. From a toddler in Egypt to the apprentice to his father who was a carpenter in Nazareth and Capernaum. From Nazareth to Capernaum to being a rabbi of 12 plus who followed him around, he experienced change. He experienced change from being, being appreciated and, and loved for healing the sick and curing the, and giving sight to the blind. He started to be pushed off a cliff because they didn't like what he said or how he said it. On Palm Sunday, you're going to hear about it in a couple weeks, they were rejoicing. Hosanna to the son of David. They are rejoicing because they're, giving him, they're finally giving him the respect that he deserves as the Messiah. And just a few days later, disciples deserting, what, disciple betraying, disciple denying. People that were once saying, Hosanna, son of David, are saying, crucify him, crucify him. Huge change that happened to our Lord. And so like us, he knows that but there's another phrase, and Sam Cooke didn't make write this one, but it's the more things change, the more they stay the same. You've heard it. Stay the same. And that's the beauty of our Lord, is that what has stayed the same has always been there. While he's on that cross being crucified, and he's got people who have mocked and ridiculed him, who have spit on his face. We heard it today in our reading. Who have, who have hit him. They're getting ready to cast, cast what we might call a dots or lots for his life now. They're, they're down ready to get, I want that big jacket because it fits me so well. It's going to be cold out this winter. They're casting lots for his jacket. And he says, Father, forgive them. One of the more shocking words that our Savior said on the cross, Father, forgive them. For they know not what they are doing. In that moment where he should have been the maddest at them, where he should have been so frustrated that the lightning bolts that he could have had come from his eyes to incinerate them, but he didn't. Father, forgive them. But that's the way our Savior is the same. Well, see, that, that forgiveness wasn't just for those soldiers, although in those words especially, it was at them. But with that forgiveness that he won on the cross it goes not just to the soldiers, it goes even to those Pharisees and Sadducees around the cross who had prompted the crowd to say crucify him, who had nudged Pilate to say he is condemned and deserves death. That forgiveness that he won on the cross goes not just to those who were standing around the cross as Pharisees and Sadducees, but to those disciples who had deserted him, and the one who had betrayed him, and the one who had denied him. That forgiveness goes... To the whole world who has disobeyed and been disobedient to his word. That forgiveness spans all time and all distance. Th that forgiveness goes back to the Garden of Eden. That forgiveness will go until God causes, us, causes this world to stop and, and brings his believers home. That forgiveness is all-encompassing. I guess sometimes that's where it's hard for us. Because we would like to think, at least if I were writing the Bible, <laughs> I would have had him say those words only to Mary and to John. See, because they really deserved it because they were good people. Father, please just forgive Mary and John. <laughs> Not the rest of them, because they're still mocking and ridiculing me. So just forgive those two. And the rest of those people that are, are, have not yet turned their heart to me, let me not die for their sins because they don't deserve it. But that's the beauty of our Savior. It was never by what we deserved. Because none of us could do anything, could do enough really to deserve his love. But in that garden, before he was incarnated as Jesus, the son of Mary, he was always the son of God. And that, as the son of God, right away when they fell into sin, when they ate of the fruit, when they disobeyed his one will, his one wish for them, he wanted to say right away, Father, forgive them. But he said a different way. He said, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and hers. You will be forgiven. There will be forgiveness. Even in the Garden of Eden, 
He longed to forgive us. That forgiveness was there again. For David, when he sinned with Bathsheba, that forgiveness was there again. When the people of Israel disobeyed him and he had to take it in exile, that forgiveness was there again when you and I were born. With all of our hostility toward the gospel, with our disobedience, our, our, our readiness to, to do our own thing and be selfish, and to be, instead of being loving, that forgiveness was there. When you were brought to the baptismal font, when you came to know your Lord, that forgiveness was there because he longs to forgive us. He longs to make us his own. And so it's not just for the Mary and John who are by the cross. And it's not just for the you's and the me's who sit in these pews. It's for those people who, I don't even show that microphone, but there are a couple of people that did things that we might think are uh, unforgivable. I don't know if you heard this or read this recently, but there's a, a person who had a meth lab. So right away, nobody's surprised yet because you've heard this stuff before, right? His meth lab was found in the, wall, the Walmart bathroom. Well, there, there was a possessed man, but we know that that happens. He yells, I killed demons after murdering of a pastor. There's explosions are rock, rocking uh, Syrian capitals. A gang of middle school girls are attacking classmates, not just verbally, but physically. There are IRS scams that sound real, that, that rake in millions. There are terrorists trying to convince people that their way of living isn't right, isn't good. And those would be like the soldiers who we would say, they don't deserve your love, God, but, but we do. We're in the pews. I'm sending my kid to a good Christian school. I'm here every Sunday. Well, twice a month, maybe? I don't know. But thank you for dying for me. I know you long to forgive me because I'm not that bad. The beauty of his forgiveness is it goes deeper than the deeper sin. It goes wider than the, than the widest outlier of, of lawbreaker. It, it goes even to the meth lab for tourists in Walmart. To the, to the, the criminal uh, the next to him on the cross. To the soldiers at the foot mocking him. To the student who doesn't get his homework in on time. And who lies about it to his teacher. That's your teacher, yeah. And then goes home and doesn't tell his dad that he, I, I know you did that. I mean, let's see, we'll talk later. It, it goes to all of us who have sinned against him. He, he, he stands there on that cross, suffering and dying for our sins. And, and he says, a change is going to come. And then that change came when he turned us from being hostile enemies of him to being his children. That change is going to come. When he, when he makes us his own and we're part of that family, that change is going to come when we are forgiven because of his sacrifice. Because of his staying the same, the more things changed for us. Because he longed to forgive us. So let's, let's, let's embrace that change. That change which brought you here today. By the Holy Spirit's power, he, he brought you in here just like he brought Simeon in to see the baby Jesus. Let's embrace that change that allowed you to give up vices and, and to live right before God. Let's embrace that change that allowed you to say, Lord, I'm sorry, please forgive me. Instead of, I didn't do anything wrong, why are you picking on me? Let's embrace that change as we repent and return to Jesus. Because we know that he longs to forgive us. My final thought. It is so cool. I, I love preaching. I love being in churches with people preaching. But it's, it's so weird that sometimes we keep this message to ourselves. You, you have changed from being a spectator to being a participant. You, you are part of this process now. So, so I, I, what, I, what I'm going to ask you to do is to go share this message of a changed heart and a changed life. And a Savior who changes things in your life with the people you know who, who need that change, who have not yet experienced it, who are struggling against it, I need you to be there and say, he longs to forgive you. And to go out there and, and share that message. Not to just keep it for yourself. You're sharing it with your children and the neighborhood children every summer at least once or twice for the VBS or the carnival. You guys are doing that. Think of somebody that you know. 
who are still mocking and ridiculing, who are still fighting against it, and pray for them. And when God gives you the opportunity, share with them how much he longs to forgive them and make him his own, make them his own. I can think of no better time to do that than your week, midweek Lenten services. I mean, not only do you have awesome guest pastors come by, <laughs> but you have a great meal, great fellowship. Who would want to be here experiencing the beautiful songs that children sing? Invite your friends and family and neighbors. Say, come join me. I want you to hear this great message about a Savior who says, repent, turn to Jesus. Because he longs to forgive. Amen.